Good morning. Welcome to worship at Johns Creek Presbyterian Church. I'm so glad that you are here or worshiping with us online if you are doing so. We are excited to have you with us in worship today. I'm Pastor Brian, Pastor Neil, who is former associate pastor here at our church, is delivering the message today, so we're excited to welcome him for that. There are a few announcements that I want to draw everyone's attention to this morning if uh, you'll look at your bulletin. And just a reminder, there are announcements that go out all through the week in our reflections that go out a couple times a week, as well as the weekly connections email. If you do not receive that, that is a great way to know about all the goings on at our church read through it each week and know what's going on. There's also links to places where you can sign up uh, or get involved in different ways. One of the things is that there is a lunch bunch gathering that is happening today after the service. Uh, so Alice Ann, who's right over here, you could see her and get more information about that. Uh, and you can be involved in that group. You may have noticed the bus is in the front parking lot. That's because the youth are taking off after this worship service to go to Montreat for the week. So please be praying for the group as we head on up the mountain into North Carolina. And we will be there worshiping and praising and playing and having a wonderful week of fellowship. There's an intergenerational Sunday school offering that's happening right now. Uh, it started today and goes through July 9th. It's called Faithful Citizenship. So if you'd like to be a part of that class and you are uh, an adult or a youth and you're interested in that topic, please come at the 9.30 hour and join in that group. It's a really, really good study. Uh, just as a did you know uh, reminder, you can sign up for anything for Mission Week this week. Uh, as you look at your emails, if you go on to our Facebook page, any of those places, you'll see the social uh, media updates and promos for that. And I have a did you know moment from uh, Helen this morning as she comes to tell us about a few things. Good morning. Okay, so everybody, please open up your book into this wonderful page with all the color in the pictures. Kind of looks like you're in preschool again. It's in the very back. All right, so we have um, Mission Week is starting next week. It gives everyone an availability to participate for a few minutes throughout the week. We've tried to gear it towards um, evenings. Um, during the week so that everybody has got an opportunity um, a lot easier to participate. This gives you an opportunity to touch base with um, some of the different mission partners that we have and to really start making a difference uh, with uh, to be able to either uh, with your hours or um, with your finances whether it's donating for the backpacks that are going to help out with kids that are going to school next summer next year with the school season, or whether or not it is helping even with our preschool um, in their playground. We do need some, some uh, folks who've got a few muscles on them for that carpet, uh, the, the turf replacement on Thursday. Um, but we've got donations of food for packing for lunches for the homeless that's gonna be taken downtown. There's so many things that I think that every single person, no matter what your age, your capabilities of physically, what you like or don't like to do, there should be something in every single, that you should be able to find something or multiple things, right? It's not a big time commitment, it's not a big finance commitment, but you're making a difference for a lot of people, right? So we would love for you guys to please, please, please consider taking an ounce of time or an ounce of effort to go and buy either some food and bring it in or some uh, supplies and bring it in or just donate a few hours of your time. It's very small commitment for a big payback. So we would love for you guys to participate and get to know. Um, we've got sign-up tables outside. We've got, uh, if you have any questions about what you like to do and you're having trouble either getting into the sign-up genius um, or if you want some more information, feel free to ask us. Uh, we're more than happy to help. Uh, the very last one is actually a very public thing to do. It's the, the Hounds for Habitat, Habitat for Humanity. Um, they've got, uh, we unfortunately could not get, we were hoping to get an actual Habitat build date um, for next uh, Sunday, for the 17th, not next Sunday, the Sunday after the last day of our mission week. 
Um, our build date's actually gonna be in August, but this is a fundraiser that Habitat for Humanity does, and it's at Newtown Park. Um, they need some volunteers, so we can, you can sign up for a couple of hours of volunteer work, um, but it's, you can bring your dogs, you can enjoy other folks' dogs, and just have a really fun day. But once again, with having that day and just volunteering a little bit, I mean, you're actually gonna be helping to build a home for a family that will have no home otherwise. So um, once again, please take a few minutes. Don't toss this. If you don't want all the sheets, rip the sheet out at the end of the day, take it with you. Please consider helping us out. And uh, every bit of mission work you do makes your heart grow. So thank you. Thank you, Helen. There's two ways to do that. You can look at that sheet and say, I'm really, really busy, and ah, there's the one thing I can do that week that won't take too much time out of my schedule. The other is, if you know that you're not busy over the course of the summer and you want to stretch your spiritual muscles, you can look at that list and pick a couple things that you can just dive right into. So please look at the list. Find ways you can get involved, whether it's one or several. We'd love to have you, uh, and we look forward to that week. Speaking of ways for us all to stretch and grow, especially spiritually, coming up at the end of July, and I know that that feels like a long way off, uh, but it won't be. It'll be here before you know it. Mark your calendars. If you are in town on the weekend of July 29th and 30th, that's the Saturday and Sunday, that Saturday night, Casa Brazil is hosting us to come as a congregation, a congregation, not a few visitors, not a few representatives, but our congregation, they are opening up the space right underneath your feet, and on Saturday night, we will join them for worship. They are going to be a packed house. They're going to have all kinds of music. They're going to be hosting a dinner for us. And they are moving their worship time all the way up to 6 p.m. instead of 7.30 so we can come, enjoy a worship service with them and fellowship and a meal, and you can drive home before it even gets dark. They are very excited to join with us on that day. I really hope that you'll come and join us on Saturday night. Please do come on Sunday morning, but especially mark your calendars, make an effort, come and join us on Saturday night. They are really excited, and they have come with nearly their entire congregation before to worship with us. It's our turn to go as a congregation to them and join in with them as one body worshiping in Christ. There will be translators, have no fear. There will be translators, they have assured me, and it will be a wonderful, wonderful time. At this time, let us prepare our hearts and our minds for the worship of God. Come, people of God, come worship the maker of heaven and earth. We praise the one who made us and sing God's praises. Lift up your prayers to the one who is your strength and your redeemer. Praise the Lord.
Brothers and sisters, for us to praise God with full hearts, we have to be honest about who we are and our need for a Savior. Let us go to God as we confess our sin together. Merciful God, through your covenant, you promise to guide us, redeem us, and heal us. We confess that we have fallen short in our obligations to you and to our neighbor. We ask you to make your name holy on earth as it is in heaven, yet we act in unholy ways. We pray for your will to be done, yet our willfulness leads us to rebel against you. We ask your forgiveness, yet we are more apt to see the speck in our neighbor's eye than the plank in our own eye. We pray you lead us from your temptation. Yet we are so easily tempted. Remember your covenant of mercy and grace, O God, and forgive us once more our shortcomings so that we will remember to fulfill our promises to you. Amen. Friends, in this place we find God's word, God's way, God's love, and God's forgiveness. What more do we need to sustain us as we continue our journey to Jerusalem? Thanks be to God, we are loved and forgiven. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Please share these words with your neighbor. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Genesis. I'll be reading from Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 15. I invite you to follow along with me using the words printed in your bulletins. Let us listen for God's word to us this morning. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that, you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you, do you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where's your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. 
it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, And I have grown old, and my husband is old. Shall I be fruitful? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is there anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, yes, you did laugh. Tom, <laughs> nice reading. Are there children that would like to come forward for the uh, children's service? All right, come on down. <laughs> Genesis 18, about three measures of flour being made into cakes, into bread for visitors. Jesus tells the parable. This is one of the shortest lessons you'll hear about the kingdom of heaven. And it also includes three measures. I'm going to um, substitute a few words that I think are more accurate to this lesson. So if you'll just listen to me, and then you can look later and see what I've changed. I'm going to the, to the Greek and what I think is really being said here. Following this reading, we're going to sing one of my favorite hymns, 
Great is thy faithfulness. So let that soak in as you hear this parable. And as we go along in the sermon then, things will start coming together, I hope. Listen for God's word. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and concealed in the three measures of flour until it touched everything. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Well, I thought I'd start the sermon today with an outlandish claim. What else is new, right? I'm preaching, so we're going to start with an outlandish claim, and it's this. If you really want to learn about human behavior, go to Facebook. Aha, I got your attention, right? Okay, no, I'm not kidding. Think about it with me. It used to be that archaeologists would go off to some far off land and dig and get little shards of pottery and we'd say, oh, we know all about these people. But now all you have to do is throw, scroll through Facebook 
And you really get a sense of who we are, right? What's important in our lives? Well, one of the things I've noticed when I peruse through Facebook are several different sets of picture, and the one thing they have in common is food. You know, there's those still pictures of somebody's dinner. There's the crab cakes, right? Or a nice steak, or a, a delicious succulent dessert. And you think, why in the world would anybody put on social media what they're having for dinner? Unless that is, of course, it is very important to them. And let's be honest, food and a, a daily meal or two is very important to us, right? The second set of pictures are those pictures where folks are sitting around the table and they're all wearing these wonderful smiles as they have that food there. It's almost like a miracle has happened because they're always smiling. Who always smiles in their, in their daily life except these pictures on Facebook? So one of the things I realized in learning about human nature is how central two things in those pictures are to us. One is food and the other is table fellowship. They are essential to a life lived well. But how about Christian life lived well together? Don't we also look to food and table fellowship as the central part of our lives in Christ? There, right in front of us. Look how I displayed the bread. I did that on purpose so we could all take a picture and post it on Facebook. No, don't do that. <laughs> it's sacred bread. But there it is, and when you see that bread, it takes you right to the stories of Christ, doesn't it? He's the bread of life. And then a little bit, we're all gonna come forward around the table, and we will enjoy table, ship, table fellowship together. So at this table, not only do we know what faithful life lived well is all about, we also realize whose life our life is. Right? It's God's life that is shared with us. Need we look any further than these elements to realize who we are? Now, you notice at the beginning of the service, I've used the word outlandish. Oftentimes, Jesus' parables are claimed to be outlandish. And in fact, in the, in the scripture lessons for today, they're both outlandish stories, right? Didn't you all burst out laughing at the end of Tom's reading? It was priceless, on cue, right? And then what's not so apparent is the outlandishness of Jesus taking an everyday activity that would have happened in Jerusalem, which would have been a woman making bread. But it wasn't the making of the bread that was so outlandish, it's actually what she concealed in the bread that was outlandish. Both of these stories point out to the miraculous outlandish actions and activities of God that are in full display through these, these sermons, I'm not, I'm not sermons, but scripture lessons. And they have to do with food and table fellowship. So let's examine together and see what miracles, outlandish miracles, are about, at least in these stories, can we? The first story is one with Abraham and Sarah. And these, these visitors or strangers that walk by, Abraham says, come on in, let's have a meal together, table fellowship. This is what you did with strangers. You became friends over a meal. He tells his wife, go take three measures of flour and cake, bake us some cakes, in other words, some bread, right? And so she goes off to do that, and then they, they have a big meal. But she's standing outside of where they are at, right? And she is heard laughing when they say, you know, you are going to bear a child, a long-dreamed-of child that you have gone 80 years or more in your life dreaming about that's never been yours yet. And now this child is going to come into your life. And of course, what she do? She laughed, right? This is a redundant part of the sermon now since you all laugh, but if I was to turn to an octogenarian in the, the service and say, good news to you, you're going to have a baby. 
<laughs> a heart attack. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> That's how outlandish it is, right? That's outlandish. But there we have it in the story. When God brings a miracle into your life, it will have an outlandish quality. And it's oftentimes connected to something you long for in your life. And if we'd simply looked at that story, that picture that Tom painted for us, simply as a Facebook picture, we would have seen the laughter and the smiles. And we would have just thought, oh, they're having a jolly good time. Isn't this wonderful how God brings miracles into our lives? And we'd be done with it and go on to the next thing. But we would miss that there's actually an ingredient, an essential ingredient to this miracle, this miraculous, outlandish miracle that God brought about. Now, this first ingredient is not the primary outlandish quality. It's three measures. It's three measures of flour. You'll notice both stories had three measures of flour to them. Where we get the ingredient that is the in the secret sauce is in the parable. When Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a woman who takes three measures of flour and she takes leaven and conceals it in in other words, hides it in there, and it touches everything. Some people say it contaminates everything, but it touches everything. That's the secret ingredient that's baked into the bread, the sermon title. It's baked in. Well, what in the world could this be? Well, let's look at leaven for a moment, can we? Now, you and I do not cook with leaven. Flashman's yeast is not leaven, okay? And most of us in this room don't even dare to practice the five-second rule, do we? You know what the five-second rule is. If food falls on the floor, after five seconds, you never pick it up and put it back in your mouth, unless you're a two-year-old, and then it's perfectly fine, right? We go, oh, don't put that in your mouth. Well, what leaven is is mold that grows on bread that has been placed or concealed in a cold, dark, dark, danky cubie, removed from everyday life. And in Jesus' day, that mold was considered unclean. What in the world, then, does this have to do with the kingdom of heaven being like a woman who conceals that unclean leaven so that it touches everything. Well, one way that we could think of that is that the leaven is a symbol for brokenness. A leaven is actually the hurt that we experience in life, our sorrow, our disappointments, our grief. You know that grief, that sorrow that we hide away and it's hidden in front of everybody's view, but they don't know. They don't know how much you're hurting. It's like a preacher recently over at Pleasant Hill is doing a sermon series, said these are questions we never ask but should always ask. And she didn't lead with this one in the series. She waited a little bit and said, here's a question that we should always ask but don't. And it's this, where do you hurt? Where do you hurt? You see, leaven symbolizes where we hurt. And what most of us do when we hurt is we tuck it away deeply and conceal it in ourselves. So as not to let the world see that we feel bruised, open, vulnerable, exposed, weak. Don't we feel weak when we hurt? And we want to portray that we're strong. If God's in our life, then we will be strong. And yet, and yet, Jesus says, En contraire, mon ami, the kingdom of heaven is like that hurt that you tuck away inside of yourself and put in a dark, cold, danky place, hoping nobody will really see just what you have experienced in your life. 
wow, that is outlandish to think about, especially when we come to worship, that this is where the kingdom of God is experienced in our lives, where a life lived well happens. Well, okay, so how does that happen? Well, one of the things I've learned is loss is an integral part of our lives. And to live a life lived well where you actually engage in your life means you are going to go through losses throughout your life. Think about it with me. When you first learned to walk, didn't your step first, wasn't it preceded by a fall (laughs) and then proceeded by another fall? So that each time that you learned to walk, it was followed by, I lost my balance and I fell. Yeah, it's kind of like that. Or how about this wise piece of philosophy that we oftentimes share with each other? You know, when one door opens, right? Well, what happens? Another door closes. We say when one door closes, another one happens open so as I don't want to have to pay attention to what just closed off in your life or my life. And yet it did. Or how about this one? It's better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all. You get in the picture with me? Loss is not negotiable. Loss is part of a life lived well, especially for people of faith. When we look at Sarah and Abraham's picture in Genesis 18 and we see her belly laugh, and you didn't know better, you'd think that she was happy that she was finally going to be a mother. I imagine it took her a while to grow into that idea, don't you? (laughs) However, Scripture does state that she was barren, which means most of her adult life she lived with grief. The loss of a dream of being a mother. Most of her adult life was defined by her loss and through it. Years of anguish while she watched others. So she concealed her laughter and said, I didn't laugh. And they said, oh, but you did. And what's her child then? Her child is named laughter, Isaac. Concealed in his very name of laughter is his mother's pain at the miracle of his birth. Leaven concealed in three measures of flour. You getting the picture with me now? Craig Barnes is a noted Presbyterian minister and author of the book entitled, When God Interrupts, notes this truth regarding our lives. We all just keep losing things, he said, wives, husbands, health, dreams, the security of the past, nothing ever stays the same. Can I get an amen? Amen. Nothing ever stays the same. You see, lost, the leaven touches everything, everything I say. And what you see on Facebook pictures of food and table fellowship at the center of life well lived with all the smiles, what's concealed in that is the reality and truth in the life that people live is that be able to have that moment, we have also had to deal with our pain. It's baked in the bread, and it's hidden right before our very eyes. I wish I had a glass of water. (laughs) I'm kidding. Anyhow. We practiced this earlier today. Thank you, Brian. You see this experience, a loss that we avoid, like I'm losing my, my voice right now. It feels bad and it feels yucky, doesn't it? And it's what Craig Barnes says, we just keep losing things. And yet, though his words are universally true, we most likely hide the hurt. And it's not in a malicious fashion. It's not as if you're doing anything wrong. I want to hear, I want to say that. I don't think you've ever heard a preacher tell you that, have they? When you hide your hurt, it's not that you're doing anything wrong. We all do it. We stand outside the tent like Sarah. Say, I must not be part of the gang right now. I'm pretty, I'm hurting. I feel all alone. And yet, 
Everybody is experiencing something, some disappointment, some defeat, a series of losses. And it's not because you've done anything wrong. Mind you, it's usually you've done a lot of things right in your lives. More times than not, it means that you've been investing in your life. The more that you give to life, the more will be taken from you. Thank you, Brian. He brought me donut holes. <laughs> I've been preaching 43 years now. I've never had anybody bring me donut holes. <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> Outlandish, Brian. <laughs> Goodness gracious. It's fun to laugh because this is a serious time, isn't it? We talk about the leaven in our lives. But it's better to have lived and loved than to never have loved at all. And as Christians, we say God is love and we're called to a life of love. And that means that we're going to also experience a life of hurts and losses because that leaven in the three measures, it does touch everything. I had a really interesting experience about that recently. I, it, it took me by surprise. And uh, I didn't see it coming. Isn't that the best kind of surprise when you don't see them coming? The, the, the first part of the surprise was my daughter Katie texted me out of the blue. And she says, hey, I'm just down the street on, on Johns Creek Parkway. Uh, her company had bought a um, property and she had come up to review it. I didn't even know she was in town. She says, would you like to have dinner in an hour? Oh, I said, yes. And I hurried to get ready. Now she lives all the way in Raleigh, North Carolina. That My three kids are so spread out now from me. Katie's in Raleigh, Michael's in New Orleans and Mary Neal's in Salt Lake City. There's no easy way to see them and vice versa, right? And I have been praying to God over the past few months that I really wanted some pathways to my, I call them my adults now, because they're 31, 29, and 26, not kids, but pathways to open up back to each other, because I desperately need them in my life. And I think they need me too. And so this was an answer to prayer. And I said, thank you, God. And we went, and we went over to Mavericks. You can go to Mavericks. It's a, a shameless plug for Mavericks. They used to host our, our can care fundraisers. And um, we had the best time. Food, table fellowship. I think we even took a picture of our food to remember how good it was. And for a number of hours, we just, it was joy and it was laughter and it was love. And then the meal ended and she was gone. She was gone to her life. When I raised my kids, I blessed them. I wanted them to grow, to become independent and go live their life. I'd read books like God Made You Special so they have a sense that they had gifts and talents and they could go on in life, and you know what? They listened to me and they left me. <laughs> Be careful who you love, they will leave you. Capiche? And what happened inside of me is I got in touch with the leaven, how it had touched every fiber of my being, and how much I love her and how much I miss her. And so my thank you prayer to God was both thank you for this time we had together, but thank you that I hurt so because I miss her, because missing her means I love her that much, and vice versa, okay? Could it be any other way? It's better to have loved and lost than to never have loved at all. And so when we come to this table today, we will all be coming with our hurts, our disappointments, our sorrows, our grief. And as we do so, we come to the one who loves us, 
the one who understands all of the things that we've experienced in our life, especially the loss because God through Christ on the cross lost it all and entered into the deepest pain of all, which is to lose a child. And yet through our risen Lord, that pain gets redeemed and we are called then to be the brothers and sisters of Christ, the children of God who love each other, not because then it makes your life that much easier, but because you are actually witnessing to the love of the, the great master of the universe who loves us, redeems us, and sustains us. So come to this table today. Come experience the abundance that God has to offer that touches every aspect of your life. And may all God's children say with me, amen. And I am taking these donut holes One of the ways that we express to the world what it is that we believe as followers of the way is to say what it is that we believe. That has been a rich tradition throughout our history, sometimes dangerous, sometimes uh, dangerous not just to our lives, but to the family connections, the things that we might lose in this world. Together we say these things as a way of reminding ourselves our, our orientation for the week as we make our next steps out of this place and into the world where God calls us. Let us stand together and affirm our faith using today the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We respond to the goodness that God gives us in our lives by giving back. The, the good that we do in this place and in the places where our people are sent is that leaven that goes out into the world. We are wounded healers. We are people who go out to do what God calls us to do and touch everything. We invite people into this house each and every week. Uh, we have scout groups. They were leaving for camp just a few minutes ago. You could not have missed them. We will have youth departing for Montreat shortly. And next week, we will not only host mission programs here at the church that you can help with, and the more hands we have, the better, but we will be going out into the community to serve. We do all of that with the support of the generous gifts that everyone gives. You can do that always online from our drop down. You can do that by giving money here at the church or as the ushers come forward to receive our tithes and our offerings.
take the gifts that we offer, bless them and multiply them, send them out to touch everything in our world. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, this is the Lord's table. It's more than just a JCPC table or a Presbyterian table. It's the Lord's table for all who believe. They are welcome to be served and receive communion. At this table, we receive the grace of our Lord Christ that passes all understanding, but brings us a peace that unifies us and joins us together in fellowship and mission. So as we share this meal, may our hearts be prepared by our prayer of thanksgiving. This table is one that we share. The youth will share communion later this week and will serve one another. And our youth elders will serve in that place because you have prepared them. Let us prepare our hearts in prayer. <coughs> Holy are you, awesome God, and blessed is Jesus Christ, Redeemer of all. He teaches as one with authority those who rebel against you. He heals as one with compassion those who struggle with pain and illness. He calls as one with the words of life to those who have lost their way. He dies as one with complete trust for those who have no hope. And he rises as one known by God so we all may live for you. God of wonders, you call us to this table of peace, hope, and reconciliation to remember what Jesus has done for us and celebrate his life, death, and resurrection. Here at this table in the bread and the cup transformed by your spirit, we are reminded that there is no God but you. For in the life of the bread we feast on that grace which can heal a broken world. And in the cup's hope, we taste those promises which we can share with all people. Peace where there is only war. Love where there is only evil. Wonder where there is only despair. For from you come all things. And to you, O God, we all return to follow. For we pray through your Son, Jesus the Christ, who taught all your children to confidently and boldly pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. On the night of his arrest, Jesus gathered with those that he loved and soon would be parted from. And he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it and he said, This is my body that is given for you for the forgiveness of sins. When you eat it, remember me. 
Again, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant shed in my blood for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of it, remember me. So as long as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim his saving death until he comes again. This morning, we will be participating together in table fellowship. Each row will be called up one at a time, come to the center, come forward. We'll be serving bread for this side and the cup, and bread on this side and the cup. Just uh, hold out your hands like a bowl to receive what will serve into your hands of the bread, and then move on to the cup and take a small cup. There's a place in your pew for when you return to your pew that you can put the cup inside of. If you need the gluten-free option, we will have that provided over here on my right or left. And if you need us to come and serve you after the meal, uh, if you have any mobility issues and you need us to come to you, we will do so after we've served everyone. Just raise your hands and our ushers will keep an eye out and we'll come to you afterwards. Return to your seat by the outside aisle as you come forward. I'd like to ask our servers to please come. Come, the meal is ready. 
Lord, we give you thanks and praise that you have fed us with your mercy and poured out your spirit in this place. Continue to nourish and fill us each day that we may live as your beloved people. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and let all God's people say, Amen. Let us stand and sing. <laughs> crevices of your heart and brings light to shine forth now and forevermore. And may God's children say together, Amen. Amen. 